so hello friends today we'll be discuss uh, the newspaper of 11th august in the newspaper i found two topics rather three topics important one was article on india china the other was on gst and even in indian express there was an article related to the gst issue there was also one article on who and uh, the criticism of who so who's criticism uh, that article somewhere in the future i will discuss right now i will discuss primarily the article in context of india and china i will also tell you what are the important points that you can take from the article on the gst issue because that topic uh, will cover or that topic is relevant even for your gs paper 3 but uh, even in gs paper 2 in case of center and state relations and areas of dispute in center and state and how gst impacts the fiscal federalism in that context this article is i will not go much detail in the from the technical point of view from the perspective of economy but i will give you one perspective and i have requested uh, Uh, our economy teacher mr vivek singh to give more uh, detailed view of uh, the gst and its issues and uh, after 5 6 days he will be giving a comprehensive lecture on gst under this article so i'll only tell what are the important points fine so the first article which is i am going to which i am going to refer is mk narayanan's article fine and uh, the credibility of the article is it is in context mk narayanan has been the former national security adviser fine and you understand that china has become the biggest external security threat to india however i feel that this particular article is uh, more of a descriptive in nature as it tells Uh, what china is doing how is india's relations with its neighbor and uh, it only tells that india has to think how it should deal with china at present the article doesn't exactly tell what is the right course of action for india so this article has this shortcoming because there is no way forward this article just leaves us in the middle of the road everybody is seeing what china is doing in our neighborhood or what our neighbors getting provoked by china is doing to us but uh, any way forward that is missing here fine so and maybe uh, this particular article is just emphasizing on certain developments like australia talking about uh, not uh, dis uh, not letting its relations with china get deteriorated but at the same time australia becoming a part of malabar exercises australia is a ally of us these things are also missing fine so now what is the context of this particular article so in the first paragraph they themselves have mentioned that the in the sorry
so the article suggests that the latest the latest this is the context of the article that the latest round of talks between the military commanders of india and china did not produce any breakthrough and the situation across lac remains essentially unchanged and then he focus on that our relations with china are consistently deteriorating he talks about the war of words between war of words between india and china and he mentions about the statement of minister of external affairs that he has linked sorry the statement of the minister of external affairs that he has linked future of the relation with respect to the border issue and then it is pointing towards the rivalry that is happening between china and usa and in this rivalry we see that despite china's aggressive stance and positions in south china sea parasal island spartley island these are certain facts mentioned still we see that neither asean like not very clearly siding with usa australia is also going for hedging not very clearly siding with usa and try to maintain a good relationship with china even uh, he talks about uk also uk's foreign secretary fine and he basically tells that uh, all countries they want to maintain china's relations with china and china is so over confident because of the scale of economic integration china has with the rest of the countries now the article also tells that how china is moving ahead with how india's relations with our neighbors have deteriorated like pakistan presenting new maps nepal presenting a new map even with respect to bangladesh there is lack of continuity in the relations or that type of uh, assurance we cannot have and uh, how china is improving its relations the neighborhood is not that friendly with context of india and then it also gives an example of how smart the china is having uh, going for some sort of deal with iran and so on and the only relevant thing that i found here is he is saying that and actually i think uh, i am critical of what he is saying that geo balancing is not happening to china's disadvantage this lesson must be well understood when countries like india plan their future strategy so basically the article is like as if india should get intimidated and india should adopt the more reconciliatory tone with respect to china and india should not try to be in the league of us that is somewhat the message we get from this particular article fine so now what is my take on this article and uh, how i would like that you should understand 
I'm sorry. Fine. So first of all, what is the major theme in the article that India and China there is there are there is no improvement in the relations this is one aspect and uh, china is obviously the most important neighbor of india and uh, it tells the second thing is india's relations with the neighbors are deteriorated and china's relations with india's immediate neighbors has improved along with extended neighbors like iran and afghanistan are also improving and uh, if we look at india's friends like australia asean and even uk if we look at these countries they are also not giving very assuring posture and thus it is giving certain clues what should be india's policy towards china so what i think is how we should look at this particular article we should look at this particular article is what should be like if a question is what should be india's approach in dealing with china okay so i want to put the entire illustrations in a perspective so that we can understand what exactly is going on and what is the right course of action for india okay so if you understand the international politics international politics can be divided into certain phases fine and these phases can be understood as world orders okay so not going very far we see that up till second world war the international politics was under the hegemony of the british fine so britain was the hegemonic power now what is a hegemonic power hegemonic power in theory of international politics is a state which has power power to establish the rule of law or some order in the state hegemonic power is like a global policeman and that state becomes interested in the order because that state also gets benefited 
fine so we just keep this in mind now after this since the end of second world war how should we conceptualize international politics fine we should conceptualize international politics whatever is happening anywhere whether the problem in middle east or the berlin crisis or any event it can be understood through one grand idea and that grand idea is the attempt by us to establish its hegemony fine so since the end of second world war what is happening is attempt by us to establish its hegemony now why us wants to establish its hegemony because it is always in the benefit of a hegemonic power it can set the terms or the rules of the order which are going to be for its benefit so i am not going into detail of this i can just understand that us is attempting to establish its hegemony because it is believed that the prosperity of us is based on its hegemony now in general studies you must have read about the cold war in this article also the author has given reference to the cold war fine so cold war was the major confrontation between usa and ussr and why there was a war because ussr challenged us hegemony and because they had a strategic stability fine they had the nuclear balance that this war remained a cold war and it has not erupted into the hot war and ultimately this phase of cold war ended with the disintegration of ussr fine now after the end of cold war we see the establishment of us hegemony as extensive as possible which is also called as globalization fine but very soon us hegemony was challenged by china fine so china because of its extraordinary rate of growth china has acquired 
lot of economic power and china's ambitions are not just limited to acquiring the economic power china also aims now is going to or is trying to establish the military power and the naval power there are many us scholars like mir shimer who believe that the aim of china is not just to challenge us hegemony but to displace us hegemony and because of usa's hegemony us defining the terms of the trade in international politics us defining everything us gets the benefit but as china's ambitions are rising so china wants to establish a sino centric world order so us there is no confusion in usa that china is a direct challenge to us hegemony so that is also the background of usa's policy of asia pivot so after the end of cold war the us started war in middle east two wars one in afghanistan the other in iraq in 2001 and 2003 but soon us has realized that it has been engaged in the war and china has taken the advantage and china has started challenging the us hegemony and the most important region where the china is challenging us hegemony is asia pacific now asia pacific is the place where the center of gravity of economic and polity is now located fine so this is seen as a big challenge now us is facing lot of problems at home also in economic sense so today the china's power has grown to the extent that even usa feels that us alone cannot manage the rise of china and us wants that the other countries should also take the burden fine so us talks about making an alliances and for example us talks about quad and what us wants us is not in a position like once britain was a major power then it started declining so britain alone was not able to manage the germany's challenge so britain invited china uh, britain invited usa now us also needs time to recover itself and the china's power has grown to such an extent that us also feels that it alone is not in a position to manage and us goes for talking about the alliances with the like minded countries and quad is one such example now as you know that the theater of international politics today is in asia pacific and now us president has expanded this term to indo pacific fine so china and us are having the major confrontation and us believes that it need it cannot alone manage the china's rise so us look for the other countries who will have the similar purpose now the other country is india which will have 
all the reasons to ensure that the rise of china remains peaceful or to balance the rise of china fine and that is why in us establishments india is called as the ideal swing state so us approach to india at present is that since us is geographically at a distance it will be better if some local power is act, acts on behalf of us and no other country in the region except india has the capacity or the willingness as well as the reason to balance the rise of china so you can even say that there is one term buck passing so us would prefer to pass the buck on india fine and in us establishment india is seen as the uh, is called as the ideal swing state fine which can reestablish the balance now you understand what type of country the china is and what type of strategic culture china has fine so china like pakistan also has a deep state fine what is the deep state of pakistan the army of pakistan what is the deep state of china the deep state of china is a communist party of china so basically china is a dictatorship of the communist party and after globalization as chinese are moving abroad so chinese are understanding the importance of democracy and one of the major fear or the what uh, what is the major cause of concern for china towards india is that despite poverty and despite diversity india is a democracy and one of the most successful democracy in the third world and once the chinese they are exposed to democracy because of globalization they will obviously ask this question that when india can be democratic why china cannot be democratic fine so there is there has been the news about the corruption by the communist party in china violence by the communist party in china so communist party always suffers from the communist party of china suffers from the crisis of legitimacy in china now how communist party of china reacts to it there are two ways the situation of china is actually similar to that of former ussr ussr was also a dictatorship of communist party of ussr but once ussr situations became challenging in economic sense ussr went towards the reform introduction of democracy 
and when USSR introduced democracy, USSR collapsed. Now, because of COVID crisis, slowdown of the economy, US trade war, the Chinese economy is also facing the internal crisis, which is often written in the newspapers as China's new normal. The legitimacy of the Communist Party of China depends upon its ability to sustain the higher rate of growth because in this way it can give economic benefits to the people of China. Now because of global financial crisis, COVID crisis, this has become problematic and it becomes difficult for the Communist Party of China to maintain its hold. And these are the situations and the Communist Party of China has an example of USSR in front of them. So they will never go for introducing more democracy like perestroika and glasnost what Gorbachev has done in USSR. Rather they have tried to strengthen their hold more on the China. Fine. So there is one scholar Machiavelli who says that it is better for a prince to be feared than to be loved. That is why a sort of a rule of terror. The Communist Party of China has established the leader of China Xi Jinping is a highly authoritarian. There are atrocities on the minorities in Tibet, in Xinjiang region and they are trying to show a hard face in the domestic sphere. That is why there are uh, like uh, they are bringing the changes with respect to the Hong Kong and China is trying to intimidate the neighbors by showing its hard face and China is going for uh, laying down the claims on the lands of the neighbors. That is why China's strategic culture is also called as Irredentist, irredentist or a country which aims to grab the land of the other. Fine. And why China has gone for incursion at this point of time and showing the hard stand. So China is going for a brinkspanship. China is trying to intimidate India and other countries. And also China wants to raise the nationalistic sentiments of its population to cover up the corruption there, to cover up the failure of the Chinese government with respect to the COVID and to cover up the slowing down of Chinese economy. It is like raising the xenophobic sentiments, diverting the attention. And Chinese is, uh, strategic culture is going for the psychological war. So China is conducting the psychological war on India. And it is up to India whether India will come under the pressure of the psychological war. I feel the analysts like Narayanan, they are coming under the psychological under the pressure of the psychological war and they are feeling if we feel like that that we should be very conscious cautious about it it is like china will be successful in intimidating us china will be successful in its strategy by any measure china at present is not in a position to start a war against India because it also has a lot of domestic situations and China sees that a counter coalition is developing against China. So China is going for its games. See, in extreme case, 
देयर इज अ पॉसिबिलिटी ऑफ वॉर बट वॉर इज अ नॉर्मल फिनोमिना इन द रिलेशंस बिटवीन द स्टेट एज इवेंट टोल्ड बाय कौटिल्या सो इट इज हेल्ड दैट इन इंटरनेशनल रिलेशंस कंट्रीज आर आइदर इन द स्टेट ऑफ वॉर or in the preparation of war and if india wants to avoid war with china because war is not going to benefit india and india should not be provoking china but india should also not get intimidated with chinese actions and the best way if our objective with respect to china is to avoid war the only rule is to be prepared for war and we have to show our preparedness by defense acquisitions by forging the strategic partnerships with the like minded countries now i feel that as far as the india's strategic community is concerned there is always a confusion and lack of confidence when we deal with china we should learn from pakistan pakistan is such a small country is still pakistan dares to take a strong action and a strong position against india india must learn from the strategic culture of pakistan and i i really appreciate the approach of the present foreign minister that he is very candid in what he is speaking about not getting intimidated very clearly giving the message that india china cooperation is to large extent dependent on the china how china deals with the border issue and very intelligently he has thrown the ball in the court of china now the biggest problem of india will be biggest problem or the biggest shortcoming of india's strategic community is that they go they fear the war whereas war is very natural in interstate relations and remember this formula if you are prepared for war you will never have war i will take you back to 1962 and i can tell you why exactly the war has happened fine the war in 1962 happened because pandit nehru wanted to avoid war and there is one murphy law which says that if anything if we think that something will go wrong it will definitely go wrong if you think war will happen it will happen fine now if we think about the thinking in india the thinking of the strategic community in india with respect to china see china's strategic culture if we see so china has been an expansionist country fine and if we see at the time of independence there was a communist revolution in china and when there is a communist revolution there will always be a problem by of a problem with the communists towards democratic india fine if india is democracy and china is communist they are doomed to collide besides when india and china 
are the neighbors then also they are doomed to collide because if you go by Cotillia's theory your neighbor is your natural enemy and when China has a culture of uh, has a strategic culture of war so even at the time of independence there was a complete clarity that China is a threat it's not that Pandit Nehru didn't knew that China is a threat every person knew China is a threat fine so at the time of independence everybody knew that China is a threat now the question then and question now every time the question is how to manage this threat okay China is a threat and the big question is how to manage the threat fine now to manage the threat there are two options the first option is balancing and the second option is appeasement balancing is you have to balance the power of china and balancing has two dimensions internal and external internal dimension is you will have to increase your own military strength and if your own military strength is not enough you will have to go for making and alliances so this is a common rule and this is called as the balance of power and as a common sense in international politics fine however India didn't go for balancing India went for appeasement of China Pandit Nehru gave unilateral he made an unilateral agreement with China on Tibet. He didn't got anything in return. Appeasement of China. He used this language. Hindi, Chini, Bhai, Bhai. And Pandit Nehru even supported Chinese position in North Korea. He went to that extent. So Pandit Nehru is not that Pandit Nehru had a love for China. Actually Pandit Nehru had a fear for China. And Machiavelli has said it is always better for a prince to be feared than to be loved. Fine. So that time also we were fearing from China. Today also we are fearing from China if we read the articles like this. Fine. And that is the game plan and the appeasement appeasement is always a wrong, wrong policy the for example the European countries appeased Hitler see the consequence when you appease somebody then war will all the more certain fine whereas at that point of time Sardar Patel he wanted that India should go for balancing the rise of China unfortunately seeing china as a threat one of the reason india went for non-alignment is appeasement of china okay now i will take you to the present even at present there is a need that we should balance the rise of china now in terms of internal balancing we will not be able to do so 
we do require external balancing but an external balancing with whom will you do the external balancing other than us us may be having its own sinister reasons to support india but we also have no other option then to go with us japan australia to balance the rise of china because appeasement will be a more detrimental policy for india okay but we see that certain intellectual class they keep on emphasizing that india should remain non aligned and when they say that india should remain non aligned they basically want india should stay away from us and india should be close towards countries like china and iran especially the left uh intellectuals having the left leanings they favor non alignment and their non alignment is actually tilt towards the countries with which us has a confrontation we already had paid a huge price in 1962 by ignoring the balancing the common sense and going for appeasement and we should not be repeating it us may be coming to us for its own interest but it is our interest that we should have some sort of balancing game and which other country if not us okay now you should understand that the position of india asean and australia is very different the position of all these countries is quite different and if we know the internet theory of international politics whenever a particular power rises the states states either go for balancing or they will go for band wagoning joining the league fine so the smaller countries like australia the smaller countries like asean they can afford to band wagon with china but a country like india cannot afford to band wagon with china the reason is even if we will band wagon with china china will not appreciate it china's interest in domestic front china's interest in external front lies in intimidating india and humiliating india not having a friendship with india and china considers india as its eternal enemy at least till there is a communist party in china so a sensible course of action for india is obviously the balancing and it's not that every country because asean countries are too small trump policies have further diluted the sense of assurance for these countries they have no other option but to go for appeasement and bad wagoning but if you see australia australia is an ally of us australia new zealand and us there is a anjus treaty japan is also an ally of us and australia has shown its willingness for quad for participation in malabar hills sorry in the so i am extremely sorry in the malabar exercises so these countries even asean countries asean countries have not gone all out for china they also need assurance for india so asean countries has also appreciated india's act east policy so from my point of view the sensible course of action 
for India is first of all not get intimidated with China's psychological warfare. Have trust in your defense forces. China does not have it's like China does not have the advantageous position in and China has China may have the power more army more navy than us but that is a potential power the real power that you check in the battlefield God knows India wins why do you think that India will not win and again have a common sense balancing is necessary fine so in international politics ultimately you have to depend upon self-help but balancing is also necessary the most important thing is if india itself think if india thinks itself that it is weaker than china then who will think india as a challenger to China. So first India needs a confidence, India needs a strategic culture, India should not think about avoiding the war, India should go for preparedness with war. I hope you have understood this lecture. Now let us come to the next topic and as I told you the next topic which I found is relevant is uh, sorry next topic that I found relevant is this particular topic related to GST and uh, what you have to understand from this particular topic I will te tell the broad theme here the broad theme is that GST is the major indirect tax reform with the objective to simplify the tax structure and the cascading effect and also for the better integration of India with international economy. Now GST subsumes in direct taxes one of the major source of revenue for the state governments has been the sales tax. Yet GST was has become important because over a period of time the service the volume of the trade in services has increased and Indian laws were so archaic it was very difficult to differentiate what exactly is a good and what exactly is a services so for many reasons this reform has been done now because GST is a destination based tax GST introduction of GST is disadvantageous to the manufacturing state. Now the manufacturing state union government needed the support of at least half of the states so that 101 amendment act because if you want to bring any change in the seventh schedule this requires the ratification of at least half of the states in order to end the opposition from the manufacturing states they have provided a formula of compensation the initial formula was 1% uh, compensation out of the tax revenue which will be collected in interstate trade and commerce but later on a compensation was formula was formed and then state GST compensation act was formed by which union government will introduce a cess and the states will have to be compensated now the problem is that because of the covid crisis and even before that the slowdown of the economy economy has not moved in the expected line and as it was as 
expected or it was told that the revenue of the states or the revenue will grow by 14% it didn't happen so what is the issue it is assumed that government has to pay cess for five years but it is no more in the position the central government may not be able to compensate because of covid crisis central government's own requirements have increased so the big constitutional question is how central government is going to fulfill this promise so in this context the expert is suggesting either to bring an amendment or to change the law and bring such changes so i will just quickly because we went very uh, deep into this india and china i will just quickly highlight what are the important points where you should focus on so gst compensation says fine so GST compensation says because manufacturing sorry because the manufacturing states manufacture sorry because the manufacturing states had to suffer a compensation formula was adopted in the constitution amendment bill and the first formula was that they will be given 1% tax on the interstate trade which would be assigned to the supplying state and this act also made this provision that the parliament can bring a law and provide for compensation so as a law came which provided an assured compensation the first approach was left so the law that deals with compensation is modalities of compensation says specified in gst compensation to state acts 2017 now according to the article what is the problem this act assumed that gst revenue of each state would grow at 14 percent every year and in case there is a shortfall state in the revenue of a state center will be compensating fine if a state that had collected the tax less than the amount in any year it would be compensated for the shortfall the amount would be paid every two months based on provisional accounts and adjusted so that's a technical thing you can leave this fine so to compensate the manufacturing state compensation says fund was created from which state would be paid for any shortfall an additional cess would be imposed to pay compensation on the items like pan masala etc then in the first two years there was no problem because cess collected exceeded the shortfall of the states and they could be given compensation but this year it has not been so because of slow down in tax connection as economy has slowed down coupled with the negative growth in certain sectors now issue and possible resolution what is the issue the issue is that the gst tax collection rate will not meet the target and the issue is that union government will also not be having enough money to compensate fine so what is the constitutional issue for that you can sorry <coughs> so basically the article talks about the constitutional crisis because central the constitutional crisis because central government sorry
सेंट्रल गवर्नमेंट इज कॉन्स्टिट्यूशनली बाउंड टू कंपनसेट द रेवेन्यूज फॉर द लॉस देर आर सेवरल पॉसिबल सोल्यूशन विच हैव बीन प्रपोज दैट कॉन्स्टिट्यूशन कैन बी अमेंडेड टू रिड्यूस द पीरियड ऑफ कॉम्पनसेशन इट वॉज गारंटीड फॉर फाइव ईयर दे से यू कैन रिड्यूस इट फॉर ट्वेंटी ट्वेंटी थ्री ईयर्स बट दैट इज ऑल्सो नॉट पॉसिबल द सेकेंड थिंग इज दैट सेंट्रल गवर्नमेंट कवर द शॉर्टफॉल फ्रॉम इट्स ओन रेवेन्यू विच स्टेट्स विल बी हैप्पी बट सेंटर इट्स सेल्फ इज रनिंग शॉर्ट ऑफ द रेवेन्यू देन सेंटर कुड बोरो ऑन बिहाफ ऑफ द सेस फंड नेक्स्ट सेंटर कुड कन्विंस द स्टेट्स दैट फोर्टीन परसेंट ग्रोथ टारगेट वॉज ऑलवेज अनरियलिस्टिक right so these are the points which you can read some other day i will discuss about who i hope this discussion has helped you and thank you and good night to all of you